In today's podcast, we will discuss how Lewis Hamilton took the final win of 2018. Also, how Ferrari did in the race. And how, after a bad start, the two Red Bulls battled up to third and fourth. And also review how the midfield teams did in the final race of 2018. So here we are for today's podcast, reviewing the final race of 2018. And sadly, it is the end of 2018 when it comes to the racing. It has been a very good season, but as ever, I'm here with Nibblo to go through the 2018 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. And Nib, how are you after the end of this season? I'm doing it tremendous, mate. How are you doing yourself? I'm, I'm doing good. I am, again, a bit sad that this season is over. It has been very good, but of course it has to come to an end uh, eventually. But let's just go straight into this review and start off with the world champions Mercedes, who had maybe not as good of a race as, as it could have been. They could have got a 1-2 of Valtteri Bottas, wasn't so poor in the second half of the race. But for Lewis Hamilton, just too good. Just way, way too good. And deservedly got the race win. For Valtteri Bottas, though, I don't know what he was playing at in the second half of that race. But he was nowhere near uh, the required, I think, standard to be driving at uh, Mercedes and to be driving at the front of the field. He was so poor in the second half of the race, Nib. What did you think of Mercedes and for Valtteri Bottas? Just what went wrong for him in that in that second half of the race? Well, this has been a pretty standard occurrence at Mercedes for the second half of the season. Hamilton just controlling everything at the front. I don't think Vettel would have ever beat him. I think Hamilton was just saving his tyres. And then once Vettel got close enough, he would have just opened everything up again. But, yeah, with Bottas, another another disappointing performance by him. Obviously comes away from 2018 without a race win. And he really hasn't been good enough the second half of the season. If you want to be driving at the top of the field in the second best car this season, you have to be performing better. And it, it's quite clearly that he struggles with his rear tyres. It, it was obvious in previous races to this. And even with Mercedes' new rear wheel hub spaces that they've got, they're still he still can't manage his tyres very well. So poor from Valtteri Bottas this weekend, and that's something that he definitely needs to try and address over the season break. Now we'll go on to Ferrari, who I don't think had with Sebastian Vettel that bad of a race. It could have been better, but I guess that's the best he could have done for Kimi Raikkonen, though. A sad end to his Ferrari career. It has been a very good one. It could have been better, but it has been good. But I think, Nib, Vettel said this, I think, after the race, that either this race or this weekend just sums up Ferrari's season. They have the promise to go and do things and you know, win races or maybe get a pole position, but they just don't have what it takes. Well, certainly since their upgrades failed on them um, from Singapore onwards, they've been lacking that downforce. And that was very obvious this weekend in qualifying. They were very quick in Sector 1 and Sector 2, but they were just lacking the downforce that they needed and that the Mercedes car has on it to be fast in Sector 3. They had, they had good pace in the race once Vettel got past Bottas, you know, and only finished a couple of seconds behind Hamilton. I feel so sorry for Kimi Raikkonen. He's he's been very very good this season, um, which certainly hasn't been the case for a few years now. Certainly, probably his best season since mm, twenty thirteen. In in my honest opinion, he he's been he's been quality this season. I I really have to emphasise that. But a very sad end for him, and of course he leaves Ferrari being the last race winner, the last pole sitter and the last world champion. And who knows, that could all change next season where, who knows, Ferrari could win the world title. We've still got a long way to go for that, but we shall see. But yeah, I think I think Vettel's right about that. And he said that he hasn't been at his best this season. And he's absolutely right about that. It's good to see that he's kind of, kind of coming out of his uh, denial that he's been in for, for most of the season. 
And I, I also must add the uh, the helmet swap between Hamilton and Vettel. That that was uh, that was a really cool moment after the race on Sunday. Now we'll go on to Red Bull, and I think Red Bull did have the fastest car on race day. They just didn't get a, a real chance to show it uh, properly like they did in Brazil or Mexico or the US Grand Prix. They just had a really bad start for Stappen, dropping down to 10th, Ricardo being passed by Charles Leclerc. If they had a better start, I think they could have had a better race result, but... Third and fourth is still a good result. Daniel Ricciardo, of course, had his last race for Red Bull. I thought he had a good race. And I think he also um, managed his race well, considering that I think he was kind of given not the greatest strategy from Red Bull. I think they should have pitted him earlier. If they did, I think he would have had a better chance of a podium. But there you go. Uh, Nib, what did you think of Red Bull and for your guy, Daniel Ricciardo, what is your, I guess, final assessment of his career at Red Bull? Well, it was weird. Max Verstappen had a very Australian start. He had a he had a Mark Webber start, dropping down to, to 10th or something like that. And then obviously, Mr. Ricciardo got passed by Leclerc just before... Um, yeah, just before they called out the safety car for the incident with Hulkenberg and Grosjean. But a, a very good race for Red Bull once again. They quite clearly have the fastest car, although they did kind of drop off towards the end of the race. And as Nico Rosberg quite kindly put it, um, Red Bull screwed over Ricardo with the strategy. To, I was very, um, I was a bit surprised that they didn't keep him out a little bit longer and try and put him on the softest compound of tyre. Um, but then just to put him on the same compound that Max was on, I found that a little bit a little bit strange. It was quite clear that Ricardo was already going to do that strategy, but he did get screwed over a little bit because at that stage when Max pit, Ricardo was ahead of Max Verstappen. But a, but a good race by both of them. And one thing's for sure... <laughs> I'm very worried that Red Bull are going to be the quickest team next year and that Ricardo is going to be in for like one and a half seconds off of the top three. I'm very worried about that happening. But hey-ho, I've got to believe in Renault and they've, they've got the right people there. Obviously, Alain Prost is there. He should help a lot. He's kind of playing a similar role that, that Nicky Lauda plays at Mercedes who also is very very good to see him back. Um, he post, They posted a video of him, Mercedes posted a video of him saying congrats to Lewis and everything. So good to see that Nicky is well. But yeah, back to Ricardo. It's been a successful stint at Red Bull. There's been promise for it to be a bit more than what it has been. You know, only polls at Monaco and... Mexico, there's certainly been times where he could have perhaps got poles somewhere else, perhaps could have got some more race wins. But, of course, 2014, where he absolutely dominated Sebastian Vettel, was fantastic. And it'll be very interesting to see how he compares to Nico Hülkenberg, considering the last two races where he's rediscovered his actual performance and out and been very close to Max and qualifying. Right now, we'll go on to the midfield and go to McLaren now. They did have some things happen in their race. Stoffel van Dorn was having so many battles with so many other cars and eventually finished down in, I think, 14th place. Not a great finish, but I think a good race from Stoffel. Alonso, in what is probably going to be his final race in F1, did the best he could, finished in 11th, did cut, I think the chicane was it three times and got uh, eventually 15 seconds worth of penalties. But I think Alonso did the best he could. And with Fernando Alonso now having, again, what is likely to be his final race in the sport, I have to say again, um, gracias Fernando, because his career, yes, you can say maybe... And he did make, you know, the wrong career choices. But if you look at the cars he drove and the performances he put in, in cars which were not deserving of winning a race, such as, you could argue, say, the 2003 Renault, the 2008 Renault, 
uh, even a couple of the Ferraris he drove in 2011 or 2012, they were not deserving of being up in the positions he was putting them in. And again, time after time, he would outperform his car and put his car in positions where you just thought, how is that even possible? And that's the best way I can really describe Fernando Alonso is with the cars he's been given, he has always outperformed the car. Maybe 2007, you could argue he didn't, but he still had a good season and he finished one point off Kimi Raikkonen um, in the championship battle. But I don't know what you think, Nib, but for me, despite not making the right career moves and being unlucky at times, Fernando has had a glittering career. Yeah, absolutely. Fernando has been a fantastic driver for, for so many years now. He's been in the sport since 2001, was it? So a very, very long time. And it's going to be very sad to, to not see him on the grid next year. This will most likely be his last race as he wants to go win the Triple Crown. And obviously he's still got to do the World Endurance Championship up until Le Mans for next season. So... Yeah, I, there are particular races which come to mind. The 2012 Valencian Grand Prix and Silverstone as races where he absolutely shouldn't have won those races. And and somehow he did. So he's he's been an absolute champion, always outperforming the car. That 2012 season will always go down as one of the best performances by any driver in any championship, in my opinion. He was absolutely incredible that season and deserved to win the title in my honest opinion in a car which was not good whatsoever he he will he should be remembered as one of the best drivers of all time but sadly because he's made poor choices at the at the wrong time he he won't go down as one of the absolute best he should go down in the top 5 drivers but because he hasn't won the championships, the, the top five of one, he, he, I don't think he can go in the top five. So it's going to be absolutely, it's just going to be so weird without seeing Alonso on the grid. For me, growing up, I always used to play as Fernando Alonso on the F1 games ahead of Mark Webber. Yes, ahead of Mark Webber. And yeah, it's, it's going to be super weird. But on to the Stoffel, he, he, had a, he had a good race, didn't he? He was uh, always defending very hard. I remember when they went down into the second DRS zone, he had a, he held off a Grosjean and... Was it Grosjean and uh, Ocon, I think it was, at that stage of the race. And some good defending by the Stoffel, which was good. And I just also did remember, yes, Alonso cut the, uh, the chicane at the end of the first DRS straight three times in the run the last three laps. Uh, to try and close it on Magnussen and got 15 seconds worth of penalties. But what did you think of the Stoffel's race? I thought it was good. I thought it was nice to see Stoffel. I, I, I know he eventually got passed by, you know, your Ocons and your Grosjean, Gasly. But it was nice to see in what could be his final race in F1, putting up a fight having great battles and just going out with a bang, how he really should. I hope he has a similar type of career to uh, what K-Mag had around 2015. So K-Mag obviously drove for McLaren in 2014 and was dropped for 2015 and then was back in 2016. I wouldn't be surprised if Van Dorn was back in F1 in 2020. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the Haas drivers has a poor season, which is likely because those two, uh, Grosjean and Magnussen, are not the most consistent. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Van Dorn was back in the sport, and I hope he does make his way back because I think he deserves another chance in a real good car and in a team that is not such a horrible mess. Right, so now we will go on to Renault with Carlos Sainz. I think he was the driver of the day to finish in P6. And not only P6, but so dominantly in that position. For me, he was the driver of the day. Great performance by 
uh, sites. For Hulkenberg, though, it was over after about, what, 10 corners in a very spectacular crash with Roman Grosjean hitting him off the track. Now, I still think, I don't know what Nib thinks, but I still think Grosjean was at fault for that crash. Yes, Hulkenberg, you could argue, um, came across Grosjean, but even if Hulkenberg gave Roman room, Grosjean was never going to make an overtake happen. He was basically already, you know, passed at that point. Grosjean needed to give um, Hulkenberg the corner and kind of lift off or break because, again, he wasn't going to make a move or repass Hulkenberg into that corner. Niv, what do you think about the uh, Hulkenberg and Grosjean incident? I I thought it was a racing incident. I I. I... The FIA's decision there. I think Grosjean had more than enough of his car alongside Hulkenberg at the time of when Hulkenberg turned in on him to to warrant him leaving him space. So I I think it is a, a racing incident. I think the FIA got it correct in that one. Grosjean wasn't doing anything malicious at all, like some people were trying to accuse him of, which was quite funny. I think Maybe because of the way that Hulkenberg then flipped over, maybe people are thinking that he deserved, um, that Grosjean deserved the penalty from that. I'm not too sure. But yeah, it certainly wasn't the nicest of um, of landings for Hulkenberg. And we'll just quickly mention Carlos Sainz. Absolutely drive of the day for me. Great performance to get P6 and certainly a good way to uh, end his career at Renault, which has been slightly disappointing um, in the second half of this of this year. So it was, it was a great performance by him. But I know you, we've got a few extra things to say on the Grosjean and Hulkenberg instance. So uh, you take it away. Yeah, I want to talk about um, the halo. Now, we can't know for sure if, if there was no halo on the car, would he've got out of the car anyway. But I think the halo did block him from being able to get out of the car when it was upside down. I have seen people able to get out of a open wheel racing car when it's upside down without a halo on the car. My worry with that was not necessarily the fire that happened because it was a small one, but what if you had a, um, I don't know, a Jos Verstappen-like fire or a, I think it was Pedro Diniz in the 90s. If you had a fire like that, then, and if the driver can't get out because the halo is blocking his path out of the car by crawling underneath the car, then I don't see how the halo, which is a safety device, is keeping the driver safe. If anything, it's actually massively endangering his life. Again, we won't know what he got out of the car anyway, depending on the angle. I don't know, but to me... That doesn't look right, and I think the FIA should try and, well, investigate and try and find a way of, I don't know, maybe making the halo possibly detachable or something. Just have something where you can try and move the halo in those types of situations because, again, if the whole car, and I know it's a big if, but if the whole car did catch on fire, then... Yeah, I, I don't think I need to say any more. It could have been a very, very scary incident. It certainly took the FIA medical team and the marshals at the race a long time to get Hulkenberg's car flipped back over. But I think even without the halo, the, the way that the car is pushed up against the barriers and how it's and how the rear of the car is pointing up so much. I don't think he would have been able to get out. I don't think there would have been there would have been enough room for him to wiggle his way out. It was a bit different to Alonso's crash when he at Australia where he was able to get out. I don't think Hulkenberg would have been able to get out anyway here. And certainly Charlie Charlie Whiting has has um echoed those sentiments in a statement that he released. But it certainly took them a long time to get the car flipped back over and not very safely. I was I was a bit concerned that the car was going to fall on one of the marshals. They weren't doing exactly the um, 
the best job, but the main thing is that Hulkenberg is okay, and I do agree with you that is still a slight worry about if the whole car goes on fire, say, as you said, with Jos Verstappen and a few other occasions, perhaps like Mark Webber's at Korea when, yeah, that was very unfortunate. Um, you know, if the whole car catches on fire, there could be a disaster waiting to happen. But the good thing was the marshals were there straight away to, to put the fire out. So it's an interesting topic, and perhaps the FIA can improve the halo with the new versions of the Halo that they're going to bring, be bringing in the next couple of years to try and perhaps improve drivers being able to get out of the car when it's flipped, flipped upside down. So next up is Force India with Sergio Perez. He had a good race. I wasn't really surprised. I thought Perez would get into the points. He's just that kind of driver. Even if he starts um, outside, sorry, the top 10, he always tends to find his way in the points eventually if he doesn't have any bad luck. For Esteban Ocon, though, it was a chaotic race, battling with Max Verstappen, with uh, Carlos Sainz, his teammate Perez, and then after he pitted, he passed Roman Grosjean in that just epic three-way battle with Van Dorn and also Grosjean and himself, and then passed Stoffel Van Dorn. I can't remember exactly what turn number it is, but passed Van Dorn around the outside, but went off the track and completed the move off the track. Now, for me, the penalty he got was absolutely fair. He would not have got that overtake done without going off the track, in my opinion. So it was a fair penalty and nice to see the FIA uh, punishing such, um, I guess, breaking of the rules. Nib, do you think Ocon deserved the penalty or... Do you think it was a bit too harsh? Yeah, I think Ocon deserved the penalty. It was a great battle with Van Dorn side by side for most of the uh, most of the third sector, and then going up into the long sweeping right hander, Van Dorn backed out of it just to make sure there wasn't a monumental crash. And then yeah, Ocon outbroke himself, went off the track, and made sure that he stayed ahead of Van Dorn. And yeah, it was absolute slam dunk penalty and of course he couldn't give the position back to Van Dorn as there was already then a car in between the two um, by the time the penalty was handed out and as per usual a good performance by Sergio Perez to get eighth as you predicted he was your one to watch for the race and yeah he only finished half a second behind Charles Leclerc was certainly putting on putting him under a lot of pressure in the final few laps for P7, and yeah, a great performance by Perez, as per usual, and then obviously Ocon retired, so a mixed day for Force India, sadly they didn't get ahead of McLaren or anything in the constructors, but still, still a solid result for Force India. So next up is Williams, who again were their usual poor selves, they just were so slow, no surprise, that's how Williams have been in 2018. Hopefully things improve in 2019. Next up is Toro Rosso. I do feel sorry for Pierre Gasly because he could have had a very strong points finish without bad luck in qualifying and the race. In qualifying, he had no power on the exit of the final corner and missed out going into Q2 and maybe Q3, who knows. And then in the race, after starting P17, was up in P10 and then had another reliability issue. Hopefully for Honda, that's not a sign of things to come. But, yeah, a shame for him. And then Brendan Hartley finished down in 12th and had not a good race, not a bad race. It was just another one of those 50-50 races. Again, his qualifying position never helps with Brendan Hartley. And Hartley is now out of F1 as Alexander Albon is now going to be at Toro Rosso with Danny Kvyat. So, Nib, what did you think of uh, Toro Rosso's race and what do you think of Albon being announced at Toro Rosso for next season? Yeah, I think I think ultimately Hartley hasn't done enough to, to keep his seat and Albon does deserve a spot in F1. He's been pretty good in, in F2 this season, the one who pushed George Russell to the final race, of course. And... With Pierre Gasly, some horrible bad luck there again. Surprised he 
stayed in front of the Red Bulls for so long, just spraying oil <laughs> in front of the Max said um, in the debrief room that he had no tear offs left because he was tearing off so many times behind him because it was just oil spraying on his visor. So some horrible bad luck for Gasly. Um, he, he, I think he might have been able to get tenth. He was um, he he was in tenth when he had started to get the issue. So yeah, and then Hartley, yeah, didn't have the greatest of races. Tapped the wall coming out of the uh, the tunnel area, the hotel area. So sadly, he just just never got accustomed to F one. And, yeah, he just didn't ultimately do enough. Such a nice guy, and hopefully he does have much success in wherever he chooses to go next. I'm sure it will be some sort of endurance because that is certainly right more up his alley. As Franz Tost said, he struggled to adjust to F1 from the LMP1 cars. But, yeah, a, a, a little disappointing end to the season for Toro Rosso, and hopefully that Honda engine can boost them and Red Bull to better performances next season. Now we'll go on to Haas, who didn't have the best of races. I thought that this race, though, kind of described how their season has been. Normally, even if it's with one of their drivers, a very good qualifying with this time Roman Grosjean, but then in the race, they drop back because, one, they don't have good tyre wear, and two... They just, I don't think right now, are experienced enough at getting the results needed, especially when you're battling for positions in the constructors. But, yeah, ninth and 10th, I guess that's still a good race for Haas, but not really much to talk about. I think Grosjean could have got past uh, Van Dorn a bit earlier, but, yeah, not that um, eventful of a race for once, Nib, for the Haas drivers. Yeah, I, I barely remembering uh, seeing them on my screen, except for Jean was battling with Van Dorn. Um, but yeah, I think you're spot on there that they don't quite have the experience to get the, to maximise the results that they could potentially get. I think you're spot on with that. They certainly could have got a few more points this race, but they just weren't able to get that. And certainly, certainly, the tie wear is their big Achilles heel. They need to address that. They fix the braking issues, which they've had for um, ever since they come into the sport. But now they just need to fix the tyre. And if they can do that, who knows? They could even have a better finish in 2019. And finally is Sauber, who, with Charles Leclerc, it could have been better because I think Sauber did make a, maybe you could say a mistake, pitting so early under the virtual safety car but still finished in P7, a good result for him. Marcus Ericsson retired with some kind of reliability issue, disappointing when he was running in the points, and I think in 8th place, so disappointing for Ericsson. Uh, but for Sauber, despite them only just missing out on P7 in the Constructors behind Force India, this has been a very good season. They are the most improved team in 2018, and I'm sure Nev you'll agree, hopefully... Um, in 2019, this team can get even better and get, say, more back to where they were, say, around 2012, where they were, you know, closer to, say, fifth or sixth in the constructors, because this team, I think, after the struggles they have had um, in the past few years, I think they do deserve to be a bit higher in the uh, constructors' championship. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with you, and I'm sure we'll touch a little bit more first life do next Sunday that for me Salba are the team of the year they've been superb they've come from so far back on the grid to being honestly the fourth fastest team at the end of the season so massive massive credit has to go to Salba and mainly Charles Leclerc once again showing his class in this race but I absolutely agree as well that Salva did make a strategy blunder with Leclerc getting held up in traffic too much, which allowed Carlos Sainz to leapfrog him to get P6. It could have been P6 for Leclerc. And, of course, Marcus Ericsson. Very sad that he got his DNF in his final race in Formula 1 for the time being. 
as we've touched on a few times, he deserves to stay in the sport. But, oh, well, there's not much you can do. And also, Marcus Ericsson's helmet for this weekend was absolutely beautiful. It was lovely and black. Sean Bull liveries, who I think most most of any everyone who's listening to this would be aware of with his great liveries on Form X, Formula 1 cars and stuff like that. He, he did a very, very good job with that helmet. But, yeah, as I said, Sauber... Great job once again, and and once again, 2019 looks very promising for them. And before we go on to the questions we normally do at the end of this podcast, uh, what did we think then of the race in terms of entertainment? I'm probably going to give this race a 6 out of 10. It was good. It was one of the best races we have had at this track, which is saying something, but yeah, I'll give it a 6 out of 10. I think we had our lulls, but we did have a lot of moments and a lot of points in the race where we did have a lot of action uh, for, say, four or five laps like we had with Ocon, Van Dorn, Grosjean, and also Vettel, Bottas, and then Verstappen and Bottas. Uh, Nib, what did you think of the race in terms of entertainment? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'd give it a 6 out of 10 as well. It was it was a very solid race. It wasn't race it was just one in between races so yeah it was it was a very good Abu Dhabi Grand Prix for Abu Dhabi standards and hopefully the races just keep on getting better and better in the coming years right so now we'll end the podcast with some questions from people in our discord server the first couple is from Simon Craglin the first one is uh, do you guys think that it's only Max Verstappen who can beat Lewis Hamilton right now? And he says, by the way, I don't think Max can beat Lewis. This season, I don't think anyone would beat Lewis Hamilton. I think Hamilton has been just that good. Maybe if it was, say, Max Verstappen in five years' time versus Lewis Hamilton right now, maybe Max could and probably would beat Lewis. But... Yeah, right now, I don't see how anyone can beat Lewis Hamilton in the same car. Maybe if the Red Bull had a better power unit with that aero, that'd give uh, Verstappen an advantage if he was driving for Red Bull and Hamilton for Mercedes. But if they were both in the same car, I think Hamilton would take it, Nib. Do you agree? I honestly have no clue. I think Max is certainly the person in terms of raw talent on the grid, but I'm I'm not entirely sure if Max would beat Hamilton. I think there'd be some races where he'd definitely beat him, but that's that's a real tough question. That's a real tough question. One's in their prime and one of them's are coming into their prime. So yeah, that that's certainly a very good question by Simon Craigler. But I think at the moment it has to be Hamilton at the moment, but certainly in a few years' time, I think it will be Verstappen in the end. He also asks, what are your expectations uh, for the Honda engine next year? And makes the point about Honda showing really bad reliability in Abu Dhabi with a pretty fresh engine. I think for next season, if Honda, say Honda until the end of 2021, so if Honda keep getting better, keep improving and keep adding even more power to their power unit, I think the start of next season, they will be Red Bull. I think they will be about where they are now. I don't think they'll win many races at the start of the season, but I think this time next year, I think Red Bull, only if, only if Honda keep improving, I think this time next year, in the final few races... Red Bull will have the best car on the grid, really no matter what track it is at, whether it's Suzuka or Kota, Mexico, Brazil, I think Red Bull will have uh, the best car. But again, only if Honda keep improving. And then maybe for 2020, if, again, they keep improving, then I think for 2020, they should have the fastest car on the grid. But again, only if... They do keep improving and there's no guarantees with Honda because just look at what they did in 2017 after what was, um, I guess, a more successful 2016 with McLaren Nib. Where do you see Red Bull with that Honda engine uh, in 2019? 
Well, I think you pretty much covered everything right there. But with Honda, if they, as you mentioned, they have to keep improving. Every upgrade that they bring has to make the engine and the reliability better and better. Because although the Honda engine has been good this season, the reliability at times, because they've been really pushing it, has been quite poor. But I think with that added horsepower, I do think Red Bull will be able to challenge Ferrari and Mercedes more strongly next season. I don't think they'll be winning any championships, but I certainly think that we they'll be putting a lot more pressure on the two top teams next season. And now the last two are from Bois. The first one is, how do you think McLaren will do next year? I think because Alonso is leaving McLaren, and because Alonso always with his cars gets the best out of it, if not even more, McLaren are going to be more or less where Stoffel Van Dorn has been position-wise in qualifying and the races um, for for 2019. I, I just don't see how McLaren are going to massively improve in 2019. I think if McLaren start to improve, say from now and you know for the next five years, I think... You won't see any real improvements until 2020, but 2019, forget about it. I don't think McLaren are going to be anywhere near um, getting a podium. Uh, Nib, what do you think about McLaren? Do you think they will be anywhere near a podium or getting, you know, sixth or seventh? Or do you think they will be, most of the time, finishing outside of the points? Well, this is an easy question. They will be rubbish. And the final one is, can Leclerc deal with the pressure of being in a top team? Now, for me, I don't know. I don't know if he can or not. We'll have to see. Right now, I'd have to say he probably will, because I think he is um, good enough in that mental area of his game. But I honestly don't know. We'll have to see. Nib, do you think he is ready to deal with the pressure of driving for the uh, the famous Scuderia. I think he is. I don't. I don't see him as a driver or a person. Being a person who gets phased by that pressure, I could be completely wrong. He could absolutely have a horrible twenty nineteen. But we we don't know. I I do think, however, the twenty and take the fight right to Sebastian Vettel. And that is it, guys, for this podcast. And thank you to Niblo uh, for joining me as ever. And thank you as well to him for uh, doing these podcasts with me ever since we started it in the summer break in about mid-August. As now, the next podcast will be the first one ever live. Nib, I know you're going to be very nervous for it, but I think uh, it is going to be good fun. But again, thank you for covering these races for the podcast with me. Ever since, yeah, the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa. Thanks, mate. It's always great to do these. And I'm very excited, actually, to do the next podcast live. But anyway, guys, that has been it for this video. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Don't forget, guys, I'll be back on Thursday with another video. And don't forget to join our Discord server. Link below in the description. Also with my Twitter and my website. Comment down below what you thought of this video and what did you think of our opinions on what happened in Abu Dhabi. Please comment down below what you think about those topics and until next time it's been me Chazzer HD, goodbye.